Good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending tonight's conversation. My name is Orsod Malik, and I'm the digital content curator at the Stuart Hall Foundation. And I'm so pleased to welcome you all to the latest installment of the SHS Reconstruction Work Program. Stuart Hall discussed reconstruction as an opportunity to reinscribe the past, reactivate it, relocate it, and resignify it in order to work through the present, reinterpret the future, and to imagine something else. Our Reconstruction Work series implements Hall's thinking through a series of online conversations where we invite writers, artists, activists to critically consider how we can build a better society in response to the COVID-19 crisis and the Black Lives Matter protests worldwide. Stuart Hall may not have tackled issues around climate change using the same language that has developed over the last 20 to 30 years, but it's interesting to think about some of the questions his scholarship helps us pose about its mediation. How is the climate crisis represented? On whose terms is the crisis communicated? On what and from, sorry, on what and from where are the dominant narratives around climate change centered? And from which direction are dissenting voices interrupting dominant narratives? Hall gives us the conceptual tools necessary to locate the contradictions in discourse or discourses around climate change and to develop deeper and more inclusive understandings of the catastrophe facing us all. The Contextualizing Climate Crisis series seeks to provide a counter narrative to dominant mediations of the crisis. It seeks to complicate top down approaches to circumventing climate change, championed by the political and business elites of the global north, to contextualize the crisis within a history of colonization, foreign policy, global economic disparities, and racial injustices. The aim isn't to victimize those most impacted by the crisis. Rather, the series is designed to provide a people's history of climate change that centers the political agency of those most affected by it, in order to highlight the long-standing traditions of communities and thinkers resisting climate antagonisms and colonization simultaneously. In today's event, the first of our three-part climate program, Climate Justice from Below, Race, Class, and Cri Climate Crisis, we welcome Janelle Tomlinson and Leon Seeley Huggins. Janelle Tomlinson is a PhD candidate finalizing her research on community-based adaptations to climate change in Jamaica. She is the co-founder of Young People for Action Jamaica and Girls Care, and is also the sustainability lead for the JAWIC board. She has represented Jamaica as the youth delegate at COP24 and 25, and has attended the ECOSOC Youth Forum, the UN Youth Climate Summit, and attended Youth for Climate Driving Ambition in Milan in September. She has received the Prime Minister's Youth Award for Environment Protection, is a steering committee member for the PAHO Cari Forum One Health Project, and was recently listed as the Caribbean awardee on the 50 Next listing of young people working towards the future of food. Leon Seely Huggins has conducted scholarship, teaching, research, and writing, and activism on climate breakdown for over 15 years. This work is motivated by a deep concern over the ways in which climate breakdown is caused by and contributes to deeply ingrained historical oppressions. When not fretting about the apocalypse, Leon likes to watch the prestige TV series, read novels, run, cook and climb. Leon is a trustee of both the Gap People's Arts Project in Balsall Heath in Birmingham, the Fruit and Nut Tree Village, co-founder of Breathe and member of Wretched of the Earth. Today, Leon and Janelle will discuss intersectional approaches to addressing the climate crisis and its colonial roots. As COP26 approaches, Janelle and Leon will share their experiences, think through examples of community-based organizing against climate antagonisms, and complicate corporate-led top-down solutions to addressing climate change. Live captions are available by clicking the CC button in the Zoom bar, uh, and the audience Q&A will take place after the discussion. So please submit questions or comments using the Q&A box at any point during the event, and we will try and answer as many as we can at the end. Um, so without further delay, I'd like to welcome Janelle Tomlinson and Leon Seeley Huggins to begin the conversation. And I will disappear now. <laughs> Thank you very much, Orsad, and, and uh, also Harriet behind the scenes and everyone at the Stuart Hall Foundation. Um, Janelle, 
Uh, I know that you uh, have conducted quite a lot of research and, and thought as well as activism into the relationship between colonialism um, and the climate crisis. I wondered if you might be able to say a little bit about that if we start the conversation right. that way. Perfect. Thanks, Leon. And thanks as well to Orsad and Harriet, you know, for just bringing us together in this particular space. I'm really excited for, you know, today's discussion. And, you know, the topic of colonialism and climate is something that has been garnering a lot of attention within the climate space, particularly in the global south. I reside in Jamaica and, you know, the issue of how colonialism has sought to underpin a lot of the you know factors that are currently embedded within the global economic system are in fact predicated on the idea you know of overconsumption and overall disregard for planetary boundaries and particularly in the caribbean we well we, we are well aware and you know we recognize that the colonial legacies of resource extraction of depletion many of these are in fact at the helm of environmental change across the caribbean and the global south in particular and you know this has been capitalized by the disruption and the removal of environmental knowledge of systems and practices that were you know existing within these spaces so individuals were able to as we say exist within nature and understand that you know we are um, a part of nature nature protects us and we protect it and so with colonialism and you know with the idea of this intensive sort of um, agriculture this sort of practices that were very heavily dependent on uh, whether it be synthet um, synthetic fertilizers and heavy deforestation and slash and burn, a lot of these things, you know, have been embedded into a lot of the practices that we see today. And I think it pretty much has shown how I, and as I mentioned before, overconsumption, this drive to produce and produce in excess are so many of the factors that have contributed to it. And, you know, we see it persisting today. We recognize that a lot of these persons um, who are currently in agriculture and within the agricultural space have had to, you know, absorb and take on a lot of what came with the colonialist space. And so I do recognize that marginalized individuals, individuals who are vulnerable, often have to contend with, you know, a lot of the implications that have come from the colonial system. And so we see it proliferating itself within the Caribbean and again in these global South territories. But I'll just stop there, um, Leanne, to hear what your perspective is on this whole colonialism and climate issue. Yeah, I mean, I think you've, you've, you've opened up a lot of the points that I would, I would uh, also kind of want to highlight. I mean, I think we can look at the we can look at it in terms of the causes and being based here in in the UK. Um, I think it's really interesting to to consider the UK's role as the sort of so called birthplace of the industrial revolution and the fact that um, you know that 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 um, that process of of industrialization relied really heavily on resources from all kinds of places, um, but particularly from Britain's colonies, uh, and it, it relied upon you know, sugar taken from uh, Caribbean islands, um, being produced by enslaved peoples um, in really uh, brutal um, conditions. Um, and it was used to kind of help to feed and nourish the British workforce. Uh, moreover, the, the money that was kind of being generated in, in and on islands, such as, you know, Jamaica, where you're based, um, was extracted back to the imperial center back to uh, britain and used to put into you know investment around you know this the steam engines the the coal fired um infrastructure that that came to kind of allow for mass scale industrial production um and it's a kind of twisted paradox that not only did those results not only were those resources siphoned off or out of the region and for the most part I mean, there were local planters who were enriched as well, of course, and local um, members of the ruling class. But, you know, the overwhelming uh, flow of wealth was from the south to the north in general. Um, but also in that process, by, by virtue of that process, we, it kicked off, you know, the, the, the emission of carbon on a scale that was totally unheard of in previous, previous human history. I mean, we had we had problematic human human uh, nature relationships, if you like, or socio ecological entanglements. Um, but they were they were nothing compared to the scale that was unleashed by industrialization and particularly by the burning of fossil fuels. So, 
Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I find the, the pivot between the Caribbean and the UK, um, partly because of my own biography and, and having family in St. Kitts and Nevis, um, which was, yeah, I'm sure you know, you know, sugar, big sugar island. Um, I find it really uh, curious and, and, yeah, we can't understand it without, without pointing to colonialism, you know? Mm. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that. Um, and, you know, the whole issue of colonialism, and I think it links directly into capitalism, and there has been some amount of restriction or persons, you know, not necessarily wanting to explicitly talk about capitalism's impact on climate within mainstream narratives. Why do you think this is so? Or do you, in fact, agree um, with that particular stance? Yeah, I mean, I think um, there's, a, there's a set of vested interests, uh, people who have benefited very much from the historical status quo, the one, the, the one, uh, the forms of society that that colonialism established, um, but also the contemporary um, distribution and extraction of resources. So, it's not at all in people who it's not at all in the interest of people who benefit from that to acknowledge the fundamental role of the actual economic and social political system that is capitalism in in that uh, in causing the crisis. So I think. Yeah, we have a role to play in terms of drawing attention to that fact. And, you know, you look at the kinds of policy responses that are being trotted out around the COP. Um, it's, it's almost like anything but address the root cause. You know, we'll, we'll talk about everything uh, else that might, might be, that, that we might be able to do, whether it's, um, uh, you know, ask people to change their behavior or, um, you know, give some meager funding for an, an, a transition of, of one kind of energy production system to another. Um, and while some of those might be necessary, they're not going to be able to be achieved unless we address the, the question of how it is that capitalism as a social system sort of structures and, and restricts our lives, right? Um, I don't know, have you, have you, is it a similar picture where you are and in the work that you've been doing, do you feel that it's kind of a, a taboo to mention the the capitalist um underpinnings of the crisis yeah yeah so i think it's similar again all the solutions and you know all the kind of recommendations talk about everything else except how capitalism continues to proliferate the problem and i remember reading somewhere that and, and climate change was described as a trojan horse that you know has been put about to abolish capitalism and replace it with eco um, socialism and for me that was such a profound statement because at the end of the day you calling um the future of small island developing states and you know future generations some for form or some sort of eco socialism it just shows how you know individuals in the name of greed and in the name of, you know, overconsumption, seek to think about things in the moment, not recognizing that, you know, actions that are taken today have repercussions and negative repercussions for, you know, a lot of persons who are so far away from you contributing minimally to the problem, but are pretty much those who bear the brunt of the impacts of this thing. And I remember reading something again, and it spoke about the fact that, you know, climate denial um, is not necessarily being driven by scientists or anyone who have, you know, the, the, the knowledge and the kind of models and the scientific data to prove that, you know, climate change isn't happening, mm -hmm. but it's by these free market capitalists who have capitalized and who want to continue to capitalize on, you know, all that they're able to get from, you know, uh, 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 economies and industries laden with fossil fuels that um, are pretty much predicated on fast fashion and trying to be able to, you know, turn around the next big fad so persons are able to consume, 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 not recognizing that we're producing a problem that, you know, others are going to have to contend with. I remember it being said as well that climate change is a future problem, so what I need to think about it now, it's something for, you know, your generation, other generation to think about. And, you know, oftentimes when we talk about the youth and the youth being the future, I, I often think that the youth are not the future, we're the no, because we have to take on this mantle of activism and advocacy, because yes, while there are individuals in solidarity with us, we don't think that that is strong enough. And so we have to be the voice uh, for change to make sure that we're able to secure our individual and, collect, um, and collective futures. And so when we look at the role that capitalism has played and continues to play, I pretty much see that, you know, there is some amount of, um, uh, uh, how would I say, 
I'm going to call it fair because again, the individuals who are at the helm of these capitalist structures are those with the power and those with control. And so maybe individuals are fearful of, you know, the kind of repercussions that will be meted out to them if they speak out against um, capitalism and the impacts that it has been having. But irrespective of what um, the reasons are, I do think we need to increasingly pay attention to that and better communicate and, you know, make those connections. So. I do um, concur with all that you have said for sure. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's, it's hard to talk about capitalism without talking about or thinking about class. Um, yeah. And in my own work, I've tried to look to, to, to increasingly try to engage with the, the notion of racial capitalism and that kind of tries to um, complicate the, the account of, of uh, class to encompass, you know, racialized dynamics as well. Um, and I guess we have to treat the whole climate, uh, the whole climate sort of issue as a um, intersectionally. I wondered if you had any any thoughts on that, uh, whether you've you've been doing that in your own work or in your own activism. Yeah. You've managed to combine an understanding of the crisis that looks at other phenomena, gender, class, race, and so on. Yeah. So for sure. And again, when you look at you know how so gender, race, class that us have all been, you know, factors that seek to either promote or hinder, you know, certain privileges. And within the climate space, that is no different because you do recognize that individuals who um, fall within a particular income bracket, individuals of a particular racial profile, individuals of a particular sexual orientation are in fact those who, even without the climate crisis, are already marginalized and, you know, considered to be vulnerable because of the existing social and economic structures. And then when you bring climate change into focus, it compounds all of what already exists. And again, when you think about the Caribbean that are predominantly, you know, individuals of Black heritage, individuals who rely on um, livelihoods, uh, our livelihood sources that don't necessarily bring about a lot of wealth or you know bring about sufficient um, monetary resources, then you do recognize that you know these individuals, irrespective of what the challenge or the crisis is, they are the ones who are continually exposed. They are the ones who are continually at risk, and they are the ones who you know, irrespective of the global goals and action twenty thirty, who continue to be left behind in a lot of these ongoing conversations. And so we recognize as well, and increasingly, a lot of my work has been focused on women and women in rural communities. And, you know, it's interesting because lots of persons, when you talk, ask them whether or not they consider women to be particularly at risk, they'll tell you no, because I mean, we're all here, we all have access to similar resources, so how can, you know, a woman be more vulnerable than I am? But then when you get into the intricacies of household care and how women have to try to balance their time, particularly when they themselves have to contribute to the, 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 the household farm and, you know, to taking care of children and to making sure the house is run properly while doing everything else, then you recognize that persons start to take a, a step back or a look back and say, well, I didn't look at it from that particular standpoint. And again, in many spaces where women are the ones who, for example, in rural communities, have to fetch water for the household, then you can imagine in the event of a drought, then they have to go further to be able to, you know, capitalize on these resources. Again, when we look at certain um, factors that affect women in particular, then you recognize that it's not even just an issue about um, being able to access the resources, but prioritizing resources. Do I utilize um, the resources in the house for the children? Do I spend it on the farm? And in particular, when we recognize that, you know, many women rely on the natural environment for their sustenance, in particular, or in, 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 in comparison to men who will probably venture out and could can easily be construction workers, taxi drivers, these things that we recognize that women rely heavily on the environment. And so anything that affects the environment affects women. And so when we recognize again, as women being intricately intertwined and involved in nature, we see, and it's becoming increasingly apparent that, you know, these changes and these challenges do affect certain persons within the population greater than others. Thinking about youth again, we are the ones who are going to rely on others or oftentimes younger um, youth rely on others to take care of them. And so if something affects the household, it trickles down to the members of the household, in particular children. Um, and again, they have to rely on others to take care of them. And so we recognize where the challenges arise there. But for sure, these intersecting issues of race, of class, of gender of sexual orientation of you know where you live in the world and the kind of resource access that you have 
Um, individually, they are a challenge, but can you imagine all of them compounded together? So it pretty much, you know, just creates this challenge that continues and it's an unending cycle. But I don't know, would you like to add a little bit more on just your particular uh, findings or the kind of work that you've seen or the experiences? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wanted to ask you a question, actually. I know you've been working with, um, yeah, as you say, rural, rural women and farm uh, agricultural workers. Because yeah. um, I... I, I I've read that there's been a particularly bad drought in Jamaica over the past oh, yeah. um, decade uh, or even longer, perhaps. I wondered if you've, how that's played out, what, what the effects have been like, um, yeah. the experiences like, and then I guess whether or not the people themselves who are on, you know, well, I, I take the, the phrase on the front lines from a lot of sort of activist circles, but whether the people who are on the front lines, do they recognize themselves as such? Do they... Do they perceive these these uh, weather conditions in relation to climate breakdown or mm -hmm. or not? So um, let me answer this question two ways. So yes, the drought has been a very devastating one, and interestingly, you know, um, there have there has been a lot of different um, challenges experienced. So I remember in particular after Hurricane Sandy, crops were already stressed. So you know, inefficient. Um, resources, limited inputs, so farmers weren't able to tend to their crops as much as they ought. And so as a result, when the storms came, the crops were particularly stressed. And then the drought came um, right after that. And so there was this proliferation of a disease, which is the coffee leaf rust disease. And it today is like the biggest challenge affecting the coffee sector. And you can you, you know, understand how important that is because the Blue Mountain coffee is one of the things that Jamaica you know, is known for. It's something that we export. It's something that is particularly large in the export market. And so we have seen where that particular um, disease, that virus rather, has been able to you know, provide so many different challenges for farmers, small and large farmers alike. And so that was one of the challenges that came you know, following the storm and then the drought right afterwards. Um, bushfires, again, are something else that we see increasing, particularly in the face of drought. Um, we also recognize that this not only plays out on farms, but in households as, as well. A lot of these farmers are rain fed, so they depend on, you know, rain for not only their uh, farm related, but domestic uh, practices as well. And so in the event of a drought, they either have to expend resources to get additional um, water, many, um, which many of them don't necessarily have. A lot of them will tell you that they end up throwing up their farms and just leaving the farms there because they are not able to you know, effectively deal with a lot of the challenges that come with um, the drought and having to purchase inputs. And so when we look at how the drought has continued to pose a challenge, it is something that you know increasingly we want to address. But again, the kind of infrastructural support that is needed, many of these farmers aren't able to you know, tap into when they talk about irrigation. It's something that is so expensive that the farmers, again, opt out of, you know, even buying these sorts of equipment. Again, when you look at the fact that it's not even only the farm, but they sometimes have to, you know, have a decide on, okay, what am I going to trade off? What am I going to sacrifice? Do I sacrifice something in the household to be able to buy this irrigation equipment? Or is it that I... I'm going to, you know, sacrifice and take care of the farm and, you know, give it up for something in the household. So again, all these different trade-offs, these different sacrifices persons have to contend with in the face of so many of these disasters. When we look at just the issue of climate change and, you know, whether or not they consider it to be something that is happening, there are varying um, kind of perceptions on climate change. So some persons will tell you that they don't consider themselves as contributing to it. It's more of, you know, punishment to man for their sins. So there, there's that notion that is held by some persons, but then others will tell you that they recognize changes in rainfall patterns. You know, there's, we are known for having a bimodal rainfall pattern. So individuals anticipate rains in May and in September. However, that is changing. So now the May rains that they would rely on for planting certain crops, they're not getting it anymore. And so that throws off their entire, you know, farming practice and regime. And again, it kind of poses challenges for, you know, certain farm management and, you know, certain things that they would normally rely on based on their indigenous knowledge and, you know, the kind of things that they have become accustomed to. So, yes, um, a lot of them recognize the changes, but again, how they respond in the face of those changes, again, is heavily dependent on resource access, access to information, access to climate information, which, again, is not necessarily something that they're used to. 
And again, when we think within the climate space behavior and how individuals are able to adjust in the face of change is another thing, because when you're accustomed to, you know, relying on the sky and birds and animals to be able to make certain predictions and now you're being brought into this for of climate information and, you know, how you predict and how you use almanacs and calendars and forecasts, it's a drastic shift. And so while it's something that, you know, they will have to adopt at some point, it is um, going to take some time and it doesn't happen overnight. So there are also things that we have to um, think about that we have had to you know, contend with within the space. But um, yeah, uh, it's just important that these individuals on, as you said, the front lines are recognizing um, the challenges and where you know action needs to be taken. But again, there are still some existing gaps in that arena for sure. Yeah, I guess, no, that's, that's super interesting. Um, and yeah, quite, Frustrating to to hear that you know that the situation that people are facing and and it really brings home this point that I think the UK climate and environmental movement has sort of started to acknowledge now, but it took a long time and it should have been acknowledged a lot earlier, which is that you know there these effects are already unfolding now. They're happening for people now because the UK is so insulated, if you like, from some of the you know we don't have hurricanes here although actually uh tropical storms from the atlantic have recently been hitting here more frequently than they did in the past so but yeah by no no means by uh, by no means anywhere near as devastating as when they hit the, the caribbean which itself is partly a feature of you know who you know the fact that the the houses that were built here are better or on the whole you know better equipped to deal with uh um, you know high winds and such where um, that might not be an option for people there but also I think um, there's a parallel between because when we're thinking about class and, and action um, I feel like that one of the things that's been used to try and stop or, or hinder action here in the UK has been a sort of targeting of uh, working class people and telling them look if you if we have to take action on climate uh, you're going to lose your job or you're going to, you know, we're going to, we want to shut your industry down and you're not going to, you're not going to have a livelihood. Um, and that's quite, that narrative seems to have taken hold quite strongly, um, which is also really frustrating because it's, it's not true. I mean, that is one potential response that policymakers could take, but it's not one that I would advocate. You know, I would, I would advocate the idea that it's possible to, to redeploy people, retrain people. We have like a, a crisis of overwork and a, a crisis of unemployment simultaneously so we have people who are doing so much you know so many hours that they're they're burning out and meanwhile we have lots of people who don't even have have work so i feel like there's already so much that could be done to make um work much more um uh well much much yeah better better distributed but also we can i think we can look to there are examples of workers here cooperatives trying forming and trying to take on and run and manage the businesses that they've been part of a famous example is the lucas aerospace um factory which was used involved in kind of um i think engine and and um the the military sector production um and it was threatened with closure or threatened with kind of being uh re restructured and the workers put forward this plan called the lucas plan to say look we think we can use our skills in very high tech uh engineering and precision manufacturing but use them for you know producing ecologically sound um materials materials that will be essential for the transition away from carbon so i feel like where where people are given the space to to think about that and where they're given the resources to try and pursue it there's definite opportunities for you know shifting livelihoods away from those which are you know heavily polluting industries and towards much more socially useful uh sectors um but it, it yeah i think that there is a parallel there in terms of uh workers maybe being a bit skeptical about um what taking action on climate would mean for them yeah um, because of the way the story has been framed yeah, for sure, for sure. So I've, I've, I've been, you know, listening to what you've said just now in particular about, you know, how individuals, you know, are trying to secure, you know, their livelihoods because at the end of the day, that is how they take care of themselves and their families. 
And I want to zone in a little bit on the global south and, you know, just thinking about this is your political agency and how important you think it is to kind of just assert that agency, particularly of indigenous people and, you know, those who are resisting and finding solutions to the crisis. And I'd also like to supplement that, you know, with a question um, in, in, in the chat that speaks to how do we build a cohesive moment, a movement that, you know, is empowering at the grassroots level and isn't considered tokenistic. So just to kind of see how best you can uh, maybe speak to some of that as well in your response. Mm, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think as you were talking about in, in some of your responses, you know, that some of the farming and, and or agricultural practices or agroecological practices that that um, small scale farmers have been using, um, particularly among uh, indigenous communities have been pretty effective at supporting those communities uh, for quite, quite a long time, much, much longer than the, the sort of so called green industrial revolution or the green, agri you know, the agricultural revolution. Uh, which relies heavily on artificial inputs and, and fertilizers and, and is depleting the soil quality and so on. So I feel like there's already lessons to be learned and a case to be made that we should pay greater attention to and give more deference to um, those communities who have kind of practiced sustainability before sustainability was the buzzword that it's kind of become now. Um, and I mean, I say that as someone who works in a department with sustainability in the title um so i feel like there's there's that um but it's also a problem of the way in which the, stru the structures of, of governance are, are set up so you know um through the cop there's not really the mechanisms for uh meaningful um like democratically attributed distribution of power between peoples on the front lines indigenous peoples um so I remember reading about the the U.S. delegation to to the this is a while ago now so the COP uh, COP fifteen in Cancun, and I think it's very similar in every COP since. But they travel with like a huge team of lawyers and analysts and and so on and and also have very close relationships to the oil and gas lobbies and so on. So they they have like this huge entourage and then other countries, um, you know, where where there's a, a heavy indigenous population or where. Um, there's indigenous leadership, such as at the time uh, of that COP, uh, Bolivia, where Eva Morales was, was in power at the time as a representative of a sort of social movement party. They have very comparatively very few, um, you know, analysts and lawyers and so on. And they and yet both are equally, in theory, are equally represented through the UN. So you've got the US with all of their um, kind of experts that they can draw on, their, their legal expertise, their their infrastructural expertise, the resources that can allow them to sort of dominate the discussions, dominate the, the agenda, aside from their kind of military power, which is there always there in the background, aside from their uh, control or, or, or um, dominance within the financial system. And then you've got, you know, uh, governments representing indigenous peoples, such as Eva Morales at the time in, yeah. in COP15, COP16 in, in, in Copenhagen and Cancun. Uh, they are they're, they're you know it's not a level playing field the, the the talks are structured in such a way as to to sort of disempower um those those uh, people and their representatives so i feel like we have to address this question of power um and how it is that we can better assert power and i guess that speaks to the question in the chat if i if i've read it correctly that um yeah we have to try and um so the, the question just for those who might not have seen it is about you know how do we tackle the disjuncture between what we've been saying, I guess, and, and then the, um, the fact that the, the global institutions are not set up such that they represent people on the, on the front lines, grassroots, indigenous peoples. And I mean, I think, yeah, in my own work, I've, I've tried as much as possible to foreground notions of justice and, and equality that, that, that I find compelling in terms of, um, uh, and secure the future, the livable futures for, for for indigenous peoples. Try and respect their ways of lives, yeah. Um, and to to hear from them, you know, there are networks of of spokespeople and and representatives of of uh, indigenous communities uh, who who are very vocal uh, about challenging environmental harm, challenging uh, other forms of extractivism. You know, the the iconic figure um, of um, uh, Better Caracas from um, 
uh, uh, Colombia, I think, or was it Ecuador? Um, she was murdered, one of many, I mean, hundreds of, of uh, indigenous um, um, land defenders, environmental protesters, trade unionists, uh, you know, advocates are, are unfortunately quite severely repressed within their own countries, let alone um, in terms of access uh, to the global or international um, international discussions. I wonder, yeah, what, what are your thoughts about this? Yeah, so for me, I agree with what you said. And I think, you know, if we are going to be able to create that space for, you know, indigenous people and, you know, ind persons within the global south to be able to assert this political agency, they need to first be seen as merely um, individuals who need to be saved or individuals who are there and they're operating in spaces and, you know, they're challenged and be seen as individuals who have experiences, who have solutions and who, you know, are on the ground. And those who are sometimes, you know, at the first, are, are some of those who are firstly impacted by these changes. I think there is um, an ongoing, um, how do I say this perception that these individuals have not have nothing to add because they don't have the kind of technical training or know how in the um, area of climate change. But if we think about it, climate change is something that yes, it is discussed in a lot of these um, fora, but it is something that experienced locally on the ground within these communities. And until we start recognizing the role that these individuals have to play, not just um, uh, you know, as, as as persons who we want to save or who we want to implement projects for. But again, you know, that, that they have a lot to add. I remember being in a space where um, following some floods, individuals wanted to come and they wanted to construct a bridge or a road or something. And one of the things that they did not do was to adequately consult the community in going about that. And at the end of the day, it failed because where they went ahead and in their construction was an area that was prone to flooding. But because there was not much consultation with the community and in the end, when it was complete, it was when they wanted to, you know, have all this PR and take their photos then it ended up being very tokenistic, which as was mentioned in the question. So we go about things in a manner where we only want to include these persons at the end to say they were consulted. But at the end of the day, we often do these things just, just to tick a box, not because we really you know, want to have them engaged and in this space. And so I think increasingly, if we want to you know, facilitate increased co-creation of knowledge and, you know, creation of solutions that are locally and context specific, then these individuals that live in the area need to be seen as experts in their own right and, you know, be able to assert that agency and that power that they do have. And so we need to, you know, recognize that they do ha have something to add um, in the long run. And so, um, yeah, those are just my thoughts where that is particularly concerned. Mm, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think that's a really um, telling illustration of how developmental, global development often works with, you know, donor, donor organizations coming in and deciding that they know what's best for a local community or area and then afterwards consulting. And we're seeing the same thing with climate financing globally, you know, it's the people who are putting the funding together who get to decide how that, that money is spent. It's not, it's not... Um, yeah, it's not being kind of democratically decided. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, so uh, when we look at it, you know, we sort of just spoke about the issue of, you know, political agents and, and indigenous peoples. I don't know, what has your experience been at the community level? And, you know, just looking at some of these community-based solutions and how do you think they differ from a lot of the universal um, solutions that are being put forward to circumvent the crisis? Yeah, I mean, I guess I take heart from a, a lot of grassroots mobilizations. Um, I was very inspired, you know, a few years ago when the, the school strikes for climate were bubbling up because it was yeah. people taking young people in particular, taking democratic action to try and shift the direction of travel, which was a which is a is a, a catastrophic direction of travel. Um, there are always challenges, you know, when you're organizing uh, politically at, at, at any level, but I guess in terms of community organizing and grassroots organizing, the challenges can be the fact that you don't have, you typically won't have resources, you won't, you're doing whatever you're doing on top of everything else that you have to do in your lives. And I, I noticed there was a, uh, a comment in the chat kind of speaking to this about how people, how, how can people kind of um, 
address climate issues when they're also struggling to feed themselves, which I think is a, a valid question. I mean, I think for me, it goes back to what we were talking about before about um, the root causes of the crisis, that the same reason why those people don't have time to engage in struggles around climate justice or don't have, you know, are struggling to feed themselves, let alone then kind of, if you like, worry about um, what might seem as a more distant issue of climate justice is the same root cause, it's the same sort of social and political uh, formation that, that has caused the climate crisis in the first place. So I think um, where I've seen community-based solutions that are really, um, um, that are really inspiring, they often acknowledge that fact. They often acknowledge the fact that the, these crises have the same root cause. It's not an accident that delegates, I mean, we were, I think we were speaking before about attending the COP and I think you've attended previous COPs uh, or you've attended the youth youth COP as well. Um, and you were saying you're not attending this year. And, and I, I know that some people are, it, it's been widely covered. Well, it's been, it's been reasonably, it's been covered in UK media that that um, this COP is particularly unequal, not that they're yeah. ever particularly equal, but it's no coincidence that ho vaccines are hoarded by the wealthier countries, which means that it's, much more dangerous, much more difficult for people from the global south to travel to the COP, and that the the people uh, who are attending the COP are also designing policies that that suit their own um, economies and societies. And it's just, that's the same. There's the same root cause or, or logic uh, underpinning those issues, and the fact that people don't have enough food on their table and they're kind of going hungry. I feel like they're all connected and. I feel like, yeah, the strongest community organizing will try and draw those connections together and the strongest solutions will be those that, that try and address them uh, comprehensively. And, 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 and rather than seeing the climate issue over here, the issue of food poverty over here, the issue of gender-based violence or inequality over here, you know, that these things are all intimately connected. Um, I don't know if, if you have a similar take or, or what your what your experience has been of that. Yeah, so I think a lot of the more um, universal solutions kind of take this one size fits all approach. So it's almost as though, okay, you're in the global south, okay, you're in a Caribbean country, so this solution should be able to suit you because you know you're all so similar. But I think um, at the community level or at the local level, the approach has been different because you know individuals are quite aware of what the needs and the challenges are. And so they're able to tailor um, solutions that are more locally appropriate, that you know, take the cultural um, situation into context. And of course, seek to make that connection, as you mentioned, between what is happening and individuals' livelihoods. One of the things that we say here in the Caribbean is that climate change needs to become a bread and butter issue, not something that's technical, not something that is you know, for academics and policymakers, but where individuals are able to make those connections. And I think the most effective or most useful um, sorts of approaches are those that speak to, you know, making the connections and letting farmers know that climate change will impact their crop yields, allowing um, individuals within the tourism sector to recognize that, you know, if these buildings continue to encroach on coastal um, kind of resources, then there will be increased challenges for your job security for hurricane comes. Again, just trying to make those connections and recognizing that climate change will in fact the amount of money in your pocket, you know, your livelihood and so you know action is needed not just from these entities or governance entities that you consider to be holding the power but as well as at the local level you know while we recognize the importance of that the policy environment and the enabling environment must be there for persons to be able to you know create change um irrespective of where they are irrespective of the small resources that they have and so for me um i think that the uh solutions that are quite tailored and you know, seek to challenge some of the existing problems at the local level are those which have you know been most effective and those which also garner most uh, buy-in from the community because again, they feel like they have a role to play. They feel as if whatever action is taken affects them directly. And so, you know, they are a little bit more encouraged to want to be a part of some of these. So yeah, I totally agree in that regard that um, it is a little bit more locally specific than those which are more kind of broad brush and, you know, top down, so yeah that has been the kind of experience that I've had and, and in particular those that have been most successful across the Caribbean in particular. Mm. I mean, yeah, yeah you, you mentioned like um, the contrast between local solutions and then top down. 
ones. I wonder if we might talk briefly about those top down ones, the 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 COP. Um, oh yeah. Ideas of um, green new deals, um, and this kind of yeah heroism of of the same is you come in with the one size fits all solutions yep. I, I feel like you have you have some interesting um thoughts and and have done some interesting work on that would you be able to yeah so i recall that you know right f following hurricane irma and the devastation that was means that i was in barbuda a lot of the persons will tell you that when they went back they saw individuals there who were tasked with the development of or redevelopment of the country. And again, when we look at the approach that was taken there, the locals were totally exempted. They weren't aware of what was happening, who was doing what, what the ideas and plans were for this redevelopment. So again, it was disaster capitalism, capitalizing on a, on a disaster in the name of development, and again, excluding those on the ground who are most likely to be impacted. When we look again at this idea of the savior complex, which I mentioned earlier, we do recognize that, you know, um, small island developing states, Caribbean countries, countries of the global south, oftentimes do not have the requisite resources that are needed. So yes, it is important for them to be able to tap into the, you know, these financing mechanisms. However, the approach that is often taken is that the, 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 the funding mechanisms require a lot of red tape, it's very bureaucratic, um, and then it takes between three and four years sometimes for individuals to be able to tap into a lot of these revenue streams. And so when you recognize at the end of the day, yes, the funding is being made available, and yes, you know, opportunities are there, but at the end of the day, it takes so much for them to be able to tap into these resources in the first place that many of them opt out of even trying because they already feel defeated in the process. And so when we think about this resource access and, you know, being able to provide support to a lot of individuals on the ground, we recognize that oftentimes, again, through this idea of corporate capture and disaster capitalism, a lot of things happen, but then um, the implementing entities who often are, you know, external to the particular space, often capitalizing more than those at the local level. And so it is something that we have seen in a lot of these top-down approaches. Um, as you mentioned, COP, there was an engagement that was, you know, being promoted among youth and among indigenous spaces. And I got an email earlier today to say, because the COP is being considered as an in-person event, then they are not allowing, you know, virtual participation. And again, you recognize that the exclusion that is being um, seen through a lot of these um, spaces, you again recognize that, you know, while we speak about, you know, inclusion of uh, individuals with disabilities, individuals from um, indigenous communities, youth, women, um, individuals who are marginalized, we say these things and, you know, while they look good on paper, oftentimes they're not enforced, you know, when the time comes around. And, you know, just seeing that email kind of reiterated to me that we often talk about inclusion, but inclusion for who and inclusion of, you know, what, what in individuals in what spaces and so those are some of the things that have continued to know you know be, be, be proliferated when we talk about environmental justice and climate justice um development goals of course are important we talk about the sdgs in jamaica we have what we call vision 2030 um, we recently revisited our ndcs we have the our national adaptation plans so all these different instruments are there and all these different um, articles that speak to climate change and adaptation are there, but what about the enabling environment? Are our policies climate proof? Are the instruments there that help to you know, reinforce this on the ground? When we look at renewable energy, do our systems help to incentivize persons you know, for coming off the grid? Are we seeing where individuals who again are trying to get into renewable energy is it something practical for them? Are there any gaps or barriers that need to be overcome? And so when, again, we look at what is being promoted, how it is being promoted and what this, um, the, the actual, um, how would I say, uh, situation on the ground, then we recognize that there are lots of things that need to be put in place for these things to become practical. And so, um, yeah, I think, I think I'll just hand over to you just to hear your thoughts on this whole disaster capitalism and savior complex and in particular the Green New Deal and just to hear, you know, what your thoughts are in these particular um, concepts. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's super interesting to hear your, um, your, your thoughts and your, based on your experience and very, I'm, I'm disappointed, but not surprised to hear about the kind of um, exclusion that seems to be being 
or about by deciding that people can't attend these events remotely it seems in a year after or in a, in a two-year period after which people generally i mean those of us with access to internet and, and um you know the, the necessary computers have, have become used to attending events remotely and online and seeing how how uh, straightforward it is uh, especially when you have great tech support like harriet who's supporting us here um it's it's kind of staggering that they've decided it's not um yeah it's it's not possible and, and i think that's like you say it's a deliberate choice to exclude and i mean this goes brings me back to thinking about a decade or so ago when I went to the COP16, which I did as part of a PhD uh, fieldwork research. And I spoke to activists there and community, sort of grassroots community uh, organizers, um, representatives of indigenous communities um, and other groups. And I was asking, you know, why have you come here to the COP? Because these people, none of these people are credited to go into the COP. And indeed the, the COP itself was being guarded by this huge metal fence. Um, and the, the, the police who were guarding the cop were the federal police, so the kind of more, more paramilitary style police, the same ones who were used uh, in the policing of, um, of um, kind of narcotics uh, in, in Mexico and in Cancun, uh, with these mounted guns on, on the back of um, pickup trucks. They, so there was no way that people were getting into the, the cop space. So I, I wanted to know, well, why, why are we there? I mean, I was there as a kind of scholar activist, but I was hoping to hear from other people. And, and they kind of told me that um yeah it was about uh wanting to 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 try and put forward the solutions and the alternatives that uh are seen as necessary and to to also um you know let people on the inside of the cop those people who think that they 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 have a kind of free hand let them know that they are being scrutinized challenge them wherever possible um, and to give support to those people within the cop at that time i think it was uh, hugo hugo uh, well uh, Eva morales i think um Possibly Hugo Chavez, but I'm not sure if he was still uh, if he was still alive at that point. But um, there were some governments, and then other global south, southern governments, who were who were kind of saying, "Look, what's being proposed here doesn't go far enough." And so the the activists saw their role as kind of supporting that action. Um, and yeah, so it, it, it's it's not things haven't changed that much, I guess, is what I'm, I'm trying to say that that the exclusion of community groups and, and people, other marginalized peoples is, is nothing new, unfortunately, in the history of the COP and indeed in the history of this kind of global summit. Um, then in terms of, uh, yeah, you mentioned Green New Deal and, and disaster capitalism. I mean, I think, yeah, one of the things that's, I don't know if it's as scary or more scary than, than the climate crisis and climate breakdown for me is the idea that the 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 ruling classes take it seriously or that because i think if they take it seriously they're not going to take it seriously in terms that we would want of, of you know implementing democratic community-based uh, participatory solutions and 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 so on they're going to implement profit making and, and engage in profit making and seeking behavior and i think that's what we're already seeing as you mentioned in uh, in the case of uh, barbuda um and so yeah, and, and, and indeed, I think the hostile environment border policy that the UK has and that many other countries have, you know, we've seen it in the in the US with uh, the deportation of, of, of Haitian migrants and, and the, the appalling conditions at the border and a new report came out just the other just last week about the conditions faced by um, people who had been uh, detained by ICE in, in uh, immigration customs enforcement in, in the very militarized border of the US. I think all of that has to be read through the lens of of seeing seeing that as part of a ruling class response to the kinds of conditions that, that the climate breakdown is bringing about so people are going to have to move where they don't have the resources to to, to stay and i think we should be campaigning for people to have the right to right to stay um they, they shouldn't have to move but as and when the conditions in, in the in the areas that they uh, live in are unlivable um, or as and when they, they they decide to move, but they want to move, they should be able to. Unfortunately, it's the opposite happening. You know, we we have uh, a crackdown on and and, and um, uh, deliberate attempt to try and go back on some of the agreements that have been put in place in the wake of the Second World War, the Human Rights Convention, the the right to to refuge, and so on. And I think for me, that's almost as scary or scarier than the idea that the, the elites ignore the crisis is that they they turn it to their own ends and they they 
they see it as an opportunity and you know there's this perverse set of stories coming out from the arctic that as the ice melts there's there's further opportunities for drilling of fossil fuels up there um i think we shouldn't underestimate these people's capacity to try and turn a buck and to try and turn any yeah. situation to their advantage yeah. Um, yeah and you know you spoke just now about you know the haitians and this issue of climate immigrants climate migrants and um just migration as adaptation because it may end up being the only option persons have is something that we necessarily that, that we really have to look at um, particularly for those low-lying and you know coastal uh, uh, countries that uh, sea level rise is something that they're going to have to contend with. So definitely in that aspect, I do agree with you. Um, I think there are a couple of questions in the chat that we may need mm. to um, look at. So let me look at first. And there's a question from Miss Elliot. Um, thank you for your question, Miss Elliot. So yes, Jamaica um, are in fact, who are the allies in the campaign, right? So uh, Caribbean nations do in fact act as a bloc and that is the AOSIS, which is the Alliance of Small Island States. And um, they pretty much seek to take a collective um, so as an effort towards advocacy and advocating for um, certain changes. So the 1.5 degrees Celsius um, increase above um, climate above climate um above pre-industrial levels rather was something that you know aosis and caricom countries start to advocate for at cop 21 in paris and so the 1.5 to stay alive eventually came out of that and so um that was something that was being advocated for um by the aosis and caricom countries um as it relates to whether or not jamaica will be represented yes our delegation left on monday and some of the outcomes are just overall objectives that are being uh, promoted or are, are some things that they're looking forward to coming out of that is not necessarily just something for jamaica but the wider caribbean um as a whole and so loss and damage and great attention um, on that is something that they're hoping for this issue of climate finance and whether countries are going to you know step up their ambitions and in fact you know continue uh, or, or in fact increase um, ambition for uh, uh, financing another area as well that they're looking for is adaptation and how best um, we're able to you know promote and facilitate adaptation especially on the ground and so those are three of the key outcomes that are being promoted financing loss and damage and adaptation um within the space so definitely those are three that jamaica and the water caribbean is looking forward to promoting um as well as uh I'm seeing another question here that speaks to reparations. So um, after I answer this question, Lee, and I see some of them are actually <laughs> directed to you, so you can have a go as well. Um, so yes, climate reparations is something that is being advocated for, particularly in Jamaica, um, through one of our, un the University of the West Indies and a department at the University of the West Indies and Professor Verin Shepherd. Um, she is an active um, advocate in the climate reparation space. And, you know, it's again in recognition of the uh, link between colonialism and climate and how, you know, what happened in that um, uh, 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 colonial era has you know contributed to the changes and challenges that we have to contend with today so yes it is something that is being promoted it's been something that's been advocated for and i guess maybe the term climate reparations is something for us that are uncomfortable with so i don't know if there may need to be um uh, some additional uh communication around that maybe changing up the terminologies so that you know persons who are on the um and that have contributed to it may feel a little bit better in being able to promote or you know contribute to the cause but it's definitely something that has been advocated for and something that you know is on the agenda within the caribbean and jamaica for sure uh so leon i don't know if you want yeah. to have a go at some of those questions directed to you yeah sure i mean i'll take um i saw steve's question uh good to hear from you steve steve invited me to give one of my first um post post uh phd talks on this topic at, um at ucl i think um but yeah he, he asks what do you think of the campaign against the edmonton incinerator in north london uh, where a coalition of black lives matter extinction rebellion uh, and the local trades union councils have conducted a militant campaign blocking motorways and so on and he, he, he says the incinerator is threatening uh, a working class area with a high proportion of ethnic minority inhabitants. 
what do you think about such local campaigns in comparison with trying to negotiate with capitalist politicians? I mean, I think fantastic. I think such efforts give me give me hope. Um, I think that the coming together of you know environmentalists along with trade unionists, with working class peoples, with with ethnic minority you know people ethnic minority people who are particularly vulnerable and disproportionately affected by pollution, for instance. I think that's exactly the kind of um, coalition that we need to build. And perhaps this feeds into a second question, which I saw um, uh, from Heather Salmon, uh, where, where um, Heather says, um, it seems to me that all roads lead to the same tables and chairs that are controlled by, um, lost that one now. Uh, Heather's question, I think was saying, yeah, you know, how do we, how do we, uh, rather than trying to get a seat at the table where the tables yeah. are stacked so heavily against us, how do you create change? Um, and I think Steve's, Steve's question is, it to, points towards the answer that, that we have to build these coalitions of, of people who are, um, who are pushing back against decisions being taken against their, you know, against their own interests. And I think it, it points back to the issue that you raised earlier about you know the lack of consultation the lack of empowerment at a local level it's it's policymakers and and um and businesses making decisions about people's lives over which they have no control or they have little control um so i think yeah that's a that's quite an encouraging development i hadn't come across that particular campaign actually so i'm going to look it up because i think we need these accounts of, of such efforts because the, the picture is often uh, really bleak. Uh, and, you know, we, we often feel like we're, we're constantly sort of, well, I do anyway, feel like we're constantly being sort of set back. So where there are instances of, of successful campaigns, I think we have to celebrate those and, and, and really build and capitalize on them. Um, and then I'll just quickly answer this one that other question addressed to me about what needs to happen in the UK to ensure uh, racialized Communities have a seat at the table during policy development uh, to combat climate impacts that affect them most. I mean, I think this also speaks back to what, what I just talked about. I think perhaps, yeah, trying to have a seat at the table. We want, we want, a, diff, we want a different table, if I could stretch the metaphor. We don't want a seat at the, the table that's, you know, so heavily stacked in favor of, uh, or rather against our own interests. We want... Yeah. Um, a reorganization of, of the table, a new table. We want it to be fully accessible, fully democratic. Um, and I think, yeah, that the example that, that we heard about from the, the campaign to challenge the incinerator points towards people self-organizing to try and build that table, if you like. Um, I think I'll leave it there and see, Janelle, if you want to take a, a couple of these. Yeah. Um, I'm seeing another question here that speaks to the role of academics and universities in promoting equity and as environmental justice through research and courses that they teach. Uh, thank you for that question. And I do think that, you know, the, the fact that Leon and myself consider ourselves to be climate uh, scholar activists um, just shows how we're able to, you know, twin the idea of, of um, advocacy or activism with um, academia or our scholarship. Um, oftentimes, you know, as researchers, what happens, particularly in the academic space, is that, yes, you go out and you conduct research and you're able to, you know, make connections. But oftentimes, and, you know, uh, <laughs> sometimes against our own better uh, judgment, it stops there. So there's nothing that, you know, happens on the ground in the at, at the local level and so one of the things that we need to do is kind of create a bridge between both the academic space and then the local communities so when we do visit these individual communities and you know we're able to gather all this data for research that it doesn't just stay in a report or in an academic journal or a paper but that we try to you know make those connections and allow students um, to understand through these courses how um, issues such as capitalism, such as colonialism, continue to you know create uh, damages within the the, the um, in these communities. How they continue to contribute to the climate change problem, and then see how best we can promote activism and advocacy as well through these arenas. Something that is being um, recognized increasingly is. How do we incorporate climate change into the curriculum, not only within universities, but as well as in the primary and the secondary level? So one of the things, again, in Jamaica that is being advocated for is the introduction of 
climate change in primary schools and secondary schools so that you know you try to instill certain things from early so that by the time they get to the tertiary institutions we then recognize that they would have already you know been introduced to some of these challenges and they have a greater appreciation for you know a lot of the work particularly where um, environmental justice is concerned so i think that is one of the ways that we can seek to twin academia with what is happening at the local level and that is something that has also been advocated for um I'm also seeing here uh, a question that says, picking up on both our points in our work, what can be done in terms of collaborative and impactful practices uh, between UK and Caribbean researchers? Also, when I say the UK, I'm thinking of researchers who have lived experience and heritage mostly aligned with the Caribbean. How do we build these coalitions and where will the funding come from? Um, I think this is something both of us can speak on um, as well, Leon. So for me, I do know that there have been cross um, university collaborations around different um, research topics and arenas. So the UE, for example, collaborates with universities in the US, in the UK, and other Caribbean countries, again, to have experts you know, in different backgrounds to be able to bring uh, their collective, um, I guess, expertise within the space. And what has happened as well is that I know that there have been opportunities for cultural exchanges between universities. So um, scholars or young graduates from the UWI have been able to travel to universities abroad and they have been able to come here on whether it be research ass assistance ships or whatever um, sort of avenues again, so that they're better able to understand what is happening in these individual spaces and how they can make those connections. So um, I think those sorts of collaborations and partnerships have been ongoing. But how do we strengthen them? I think the universities now probably need to recognize um, the importance of uh, making those connections and increased connections, and in particular, engaging the students in um, the ongoing work. Uh, Leon, I don't know what your thoughts are, but I think I will close there on that particular mm. matter. Yeah, I mean, I think so. Um, at the University where I work, University of Warwick, it's uh, has a Center for Caribbean Studies, and we have. Um, in the past invited uh, visiting visiting fellows from from uh, the Caribbean um, to come and, and you know um, spend time at the institution so as on when you have availability and, and travel returns to some kind of um, feasible situation uh, then you know it'd be great to have you come over um, Janelle um, but I think a lot of those networks are there uh, both formally and informally I, I know of um, geographer at the University of Birmingham, uh, Pat Noxolo had a, a really big project on uh, Caribbean uh, risk and insecurity, and that involved collaborations with between people based here in the UK, people based in the States, people based in the Caribbean, um, and further afield as well. So I think um, that work is is going is ongoing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think maybe we can um, try to bring in one last question before <laughs> it's time for us to close. Um, I think this is an, is, an, is an interesting one. Is it possible to end climate change in a capitalist world? Leon, what are your final thoughts? Uh, to save time, I'll just say no. Uh, <laughs> with the caveat that we might be able to address climate breakdown. With Climate breakdown is being addressed in the capitalist world, but it's not being addressed in the way that I think most of us would want it to be so it's it's not addressing it's the related issues of inequality and the fallout of climate breakdown it's just addressing the question of how do you make more money as the as the planet burns yeah uh, my response to that question i remember being on a panel discussion recently and the question was is 1.5 degrees attainable um, given the existing challenges that we're facing. And to be honest with you, the fact that um, ambition on uh, you know, the reduction of the usage of fossil fuels is still lacking, the fact that climate finance is still lacking, the fact that you know, the urgency that is required is not necessarily being uh, you know, pushed forward, then I recognize that, of course, um, as much as we want to remain as optimistic as possible, then you know, a 1.5 degree increase above pre-industrial levels is not something that we're going to see. And again, with um, global uh, uh, um, power power houses, as I'd like to call them, not necessarily taking action that is necessary, then climate change are uh, within a capitalist society will continue um, until they recognize the role that these economies play and recognize that you know small island states are dependent on them um, for our overall survival. 
yeah. So I think we might be rejoined now. Quite yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I know I said it will. Hi, hi, hi. Thank you both for such an incredible, I mean, I could have listened to that for another, I don't even know how long that was excellent. Um, you are both so uh, generous with your perspectives and your experiences and, and so erudite and, and, and it was such a critical, critical conversation. Um, I suppose before we close, I, I had one, one more question for you both and, and you both speak with such passion um, and, you, and you're both really, I, I guess, unwavering in your focus of thinking about the whole political formation and thinking about um, not thinking about things, you know, siloed off, but you're bringing, you know, whether it's gender, whether it's class, whether it's, you know, um, you know, indigenous rights, you're, you're really bringing in and also from a transnational perspective. So I, I guess my question is, you know, I feel like there might be a connection, so, but um, in terms of, you know, how do you stay optimistic? How do you how do you maintain that passion? How do you how do you push, you know, against the grain, you know, and 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 keep doing it? I'm sure, um, as we as we all face down this crisis, I'm sure this whatever your answers are will help deeply. Um, so yeah. Um, I'll just go first. I because I get asked this question a lot. Uh, so COVID has you know been. A challenge for a lot of us and one of the first questions that we get is how do you guys remain you know so active within the space particularly you know in a, in a pandemic and I think pandemic or not I must recognize that as a young person a young black woman in the first place in a Caribbean country that is to be plagued and continues to be plagued by uh, the impacts of climate change I have no choice but you know to play my part in advocacy in activism and education particularly because I recognize that this is an area that is lacking um, and needs to be improved upon in the, you know, the individual spaces in which I work. Again, growing up in rural Jamaica, I recognize how heavily individuals rely on you know, the, the, the environment for their sustenance, for their children. And for me, I understand that you know, there are these larger individuals with all the power who do not seem to care, but I think that you know at the local level i have a part to play i have to you know continue the advocacy i have to continue to engage and continue to create opportunities for you know making sure that those who are most susceptible and those who are going to be you know most impacted understand what these challenges are and can understand as well how they can you know even implement small changes to be able to reduce some of these impacts so for me it's more of a personal responsibility mm -hmm. than anything else based on where i live based on you know the, the factors that are already at play and again in just trying to spread awareness not just in these spaces but you know in other regions where i don't think the information hits as close to home so i think those are just some of the things that continue to keep me motivated irrespective of you know everything else that is happening mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd echo a lot of that. I think for me, it, it feels like a responsibility in terms of, um, you know, uh, leveraging some of the privileges that I enjoy being based here in the UK, um, the access to resources, the the kind of um, proximity to, to to power. I mean, not not trying to pretend I've got like the ear of, of Boris Johnson or anything like that, but, you know, being, being located in the belly of the beast, if you like, um, so there's that kind of obligation. It's it's yeah a, a connection to to family and friends out in the region in the Caribbean and and elsewhere, uh, and it's I think it's it's taking inspiration from some of those examples that we've we've spoken about this this evening in terms of the the practices that people undertake to try and turn things around and and you know supporting those and and boosting them and taking heart from them because um, you know people do resist and people do uh, shift things um, against the odds as well so I think yeah th those would be my my go-tos it's, it is a challenge as well to stay positive in the face of, of a lot of this um, particularly if you're working with data you know the the projections the modeling and so on but yeah I don't I think we just have to try uh, and maintain that and a, a healthy healthy work-life balance as well where possible to have a sense of perspective you know a sense of the things that that bring value to the world the things that are meaningful about human creativity human output that 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 can counter some of those more negative aspects of human human uh well, thank you both so much um those were excellent excellent responses and i just think that the conversation in general uh was an incredibly empowering one and i think you both 
we're able to cut through a lot of the um, the information that is being given to us so so constantly, and you're both able to interrupt that discourse that 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 um, that is coming from the top really well. Um, so I'm afraid we'll have to end it there. Um, but thank you, Janelle, and thank you, Leon, so so much for joining us and and for giving uh, us your time and your expertise. And thank you to all the um, audience members who posed questions, and thank you everyone who who came and who. Um, spend time a bit more time in front of their computers while they've been working uh we do really really appreciate it um i've got like a couple of announce oh, well more than a couple just a few announcements um just before we break um the first is that we'll be sharing the recording online soon um it usually takes us you know about two weeks um so uh please subscribe to our youtube channel um and uh keep an eye on the explore section of our website um, for more content. Um, and we're really, really excited to share this one with you. Um, and um, yeah, please make sure to sign up to our newsletter. We've got some really exciting events coming up. Uh, in particular, uh, we have an event on uh, media coming up soon. And we also uh, have uh, the two remaining parts of our, of our climate change series. The first one is called Frontlines, Land and the Climate Crisis, which we're really excited to share with you and then also we have an article series coming out on um, contextualizing the climate crisis as part of this series of discussions um, and um, and also uh, we are hiring so come and join us we're looking for a freelance admin assistant um, the deadline is the 8th of November uh, there's more information on that on our website um, so please uh, have a look um, come join Harriet Ilsa and I um, um, we'd be really, really excited to have you. Um, and, um, and finally, if you enjoyed this event, um, we are a very small organization with very, very big ambitions. So please, um, yeah, please consider donating uh, uh, through our website. Um, it's really, really a pleasure to host these events and, and we want to keep doing them. So, um, so thank you again, Leon and Janelle. Um, really, really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll speak soon. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Thanks.